Hey, in this segment, we're going to deal with God's omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. And uh, by the way, if you're wondering why I'm overdressed like this, it's 90-plus uh, degrees in uh, North Carolina, and uh, I don't use air conditioning very much, so I just dress very informally. Anyway, omnipotence. We as humans have something analogous in our experience. Um, contrary to the notion of self-existence, there is nothing analogous in our experience to self, God's self-existence, uh, where he exists and he exists, but he exists necessarily. And we exist uh, derivatively. But, um, and of course our power comes from him, but we know his, um, because of our, the fact that we do have some potency, some power, we have some an analogous experience um, with the idea of omnipotence anyway. Of course, it's beyond um, our comprehension, um, ultimately, the fact that God is all-powerful. I'm going to try to make this quicker uh, than some of the other segments. So let's jump in real quick. Um, Quoting from 2 Chronicles 26, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. And quoting from Isaiah 43, There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Now, as far as verses that have to do with God's omnipotence, is they are countless. Uh, so it was a matter of just choice, trying to figure out which ones to, to choose from. Uh, uh, crucial to an understanding of, of God is the fact that he's all-powerful. And we have a tendency to kind of pick and choose which attributes of God that, that are our favorite. And they can almost turn into an idolatry, if you think about it. And um, though we can distinguish the various attributes of God, we have to remember there's a notion that's called the simplicity of God. And what that simply means is that God, all these attributes of God, He has them at the same time, and they can't really be uh, separated from each other. You know, when he expresses his love to us, he is still at the same time almighty, holy, just, and so forth. Um, you know, we we may have some power, we may have some wisdom or some good, goodness or something, but God is holy. Uh, he is all-powerful. Um, he is wise and uh, whereas, you know, where his his attributes are who he is, um, when it comes to us, those are things that we have. It's not who we are because at one moment I might be good, the next moment I might be bad, <laughs> you know. So, in the Old Testament, God is referred to as El Shaddai, and in the New Testament, Pantocrator. In the Greek, and they both mean God Almighty. The concept there is that since God created Genesis 1 1 all things, heavens and earth, that means He owns all things. And since He owns all things, He governs all things. And by all things, we're talking about on the macro scale and the micro scale. And that means that every molecule. And this vast cosmos is under God's sovereign, all-powerful control. Because if there was just one single maverick molecule that was outside of God's sovereign, all-powerful control, it might be that one maverick molecule that comes smashing down through the atmosphere that lays waste God's plan to bring back Christ at the perfect time. So, by definition, God has to be all-powerful, and that power 
is expressed through his sovereign control over his creation. And we'll talk about the notion of sovereignty more in another segment, but just want to focus on the idea of him, him being all powerful in this session. So, how do we um, understand what it means to say that God is all powerful? Well, it means at least two things. It means that God can do anything he pleases. God can do anything he pleases. And then second, nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for God. And then from those two, I'm going to give a, a preliminary definition of God's omnipotence um, from Scripture. God can do anything compatible with his attributes. God can do anything compatible with his attributes. Now, um, in saying th that, I think that um, it's a good time to discuss what um, in uh, his omnipotence does not mean. Because when talking about what's you know compatible with his attributes, because there are certain things that are not. Uh, theologians refer to these as preventers. Um, saying that God is powerful does not mean that he can do things that are logically contradictory. Um, and this should not be seen as a weakness um, at all. In fact, it's an expression of his, uh, let's see here. Just an expression of his excellency. I wanted to, to read, if I may, from, from John Frame in this regard, regarding the logical um, consistency. You know, God, even God in his, his omnipotence cannot make a round square or a rope with only one end. As, um, God is a logical, rational being, though he does not necessarily conform to the laws of any human system of logic. The laws of logic are an aspect of his own character. Did you get that? The laws of logic are an aspect of his own character. Um, Aristotle did not invent logic. He discovered them, just like we discover other things. Being logical is his nature and is his pleasure. So the fact that he cannot be illogical is not a weakness. It may not be fairly described as a lack of power. Indeed, it is a mark of his great power that he always acts and thinks consistently, that he can never be pushed into the inconsistencies that plague human life. We know here, as we do with other, quote, qualifications of omnipotence, that there are problems with language in this discussion. Not every inability is a lack of power. Indeed, again, some inabilities are marks of extraordinary power. Listen to this analogy. Imagine a baseball player who hits a home run whenever he comes to the plate. Someone might say of him, he can't hit singles or doubles. Now that sounds like a weakness until you look at the broader context, which is every time he comes up, he has a home run. <clears throat> so in the case of God's inability to be illogical, what prevents his illogicality is his righteousness, faithfulness, truth, rational speech, knowledge, and wisdom. God's incapacity here is not due to illness, injury, lack of strength, the crowded schedule, and so on. It's due to traits that are wholly admirable. This sort of reasoning will help us to see how alleged divine inabilities are really strengths. Okay? So, I heard just today two different guys blasphemously using the notion of... Um, this very this very idea of um, God not being able to do 
trying to trying to pin him to the wall as far as uh, contradictions and so forth. Um, I mean, we're talking about the most blasphemous language, um, and it, it really hurt my heart to, to hear them talk like that. So that's one of the reasons why I took the time to, to read that, in case there's one or two of you who, who really does struggle with that. Okay. All righty. <clears throat> so logical contradictory statements are, are, are not consistent with omnipotence and then secondly immoral actions are inconsistent with omnipotence things a lot like lying stealing or breaking promises in titus 1 2 we're told that god cannot lie uh, absurdus is inability to lie and that is obviously not a, a limitation um, i guess you could look at it in that sense <clears throat> but it's an expression of god's moral excellence uh, would, we, would we look at God as being higher if he did lie um, or had the ability? Uh, I think not. And um, in Hebrews, I believe it's 6, uh, talks about how, you know, God does not, um, he swears by that which he, no, nothing higher than he could swear but by himself, cannot break, uh, he swears by himself. So, his omnipotent powers are defined by his whole nature. And all of his um, attributes display his omnipotent power. His love displays his omnipotent power. His mercy displays his omnipotent power. Um, and the list goes on and on. You know, every attribute that you could think of. Uh, displays that and again that's part of what we call the simplicity of God's um, nature is that it's not composite um, his uh, attributes they are should be seen as interconnected and viewed as as one you know we can for for um, helping us to understand each one we can distinguish them but in God's own character, uh, they are all they are all part of Him at the same time, and are displayed at the same time. Though one might be more evident as far as what we experience in our own um, circumstances. So, you know, really the only preventers, um, inabilities, if you will, are His truth. Truthfulness, his righteousness, and his faithfulness. And I think we would all agree that those are hardly things to lament over. Now, where do we see God's omnipotence? Well, we alluded to this in Genesis 1.1. God shows his omnipotence in the fact that he... Um, creates an entire cosmos out of nothing there's no prior material that he bends and shapes nothing um, the nothingness that existed prior to creation obeyed him and the vast cosmos and i um i'm not sure how big astronomers are saying the universe is now. Uh, last I heard it was like 15 trillion light years. Anyway, it's, it's just huge, <laughs> the universe. And um, it's a number is way past my ability to think. Um, so in creation, we see God's omnipotence for sure. But you know what? That's in the past. Where we tend to forget God's omnipotent power is most clearly expressed today when someone is converted or saved. It takes the same amount of power that created the universe out of nothing to save a person who is dead in sin. 
and enslaved to sin and Satan. It takes the same almighty power to turn that person, to regenerate them, incline their heart towards God, quicken them from spiritual death to life, and to monergistically save them. That means one energy, one divine, sovereign grace, God bringing um, someone to himself. That is a miracle. That is a huge display of God's omnipotent power um, on a mighty scale. And... Um, we, we should never lose sight of that fact of how much power it takes for someone to be converted and that it is God who is the one who ultimately converts and it's not our ultimately up to our persuasive abilities we have our place as far as um, speaking the gospel but the words itself of scripture are all, are all powerful. Remember Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. And this notion of God being omnipotent, like all doctrines, is meant to edify us. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 is profitable in many many ways and when you look at the context in which the omnipotence of God is expressed in the Bible is you know it's not in a context of rational um, detached discussion you know it's always in the context of worship and uh, awe and praise. And that's what all true theology should lead to is doxology. And um, we could define theology as applying all of scripture to all of life. And all of theology should lead to worship or doxology. But in particular, as we're talking about God's omnipotence, um, that's something that the psalmist, Isaiah, and so forth, I'm thinking specifically of the psalmist, is look through the psalms and pray through the psalms. And there's a psalm for every emotion imaginable. There, there really is. And you'd be astonished at how honest the psalmist is. It's shocking at times. And I would encourage you to reread the psalms and to be as bold as David was. We should be bolder because we are this side of the New Covenant. But Boy, the way that they talk with God, it was not disrespectfully, but they unloaded their hearts. You know, it was like, um, why and how long? You know, there's two biggies there. And I'm sure you can relate. Why and how long? Somebody that's listening to this is dealing with that. I know you are. So, we can summarize um, this notion of God's omnipotence with five closing comments. Omnipotence means that uh, he can do, God can do anything compatible with his attributes. Two, his sovereign power extends over all creation. Three, the Lord's omnipotence is a threat to the wicked, but it's a comfort to the believer. And for those of you who know Christ, 
I urge you to meditate on how God's omnipotence is a comfort to you. God's uh, power is actually greater than anything that you have experienced or seen. Um, he can um, he can do anything. Doesn't mean that uh, he'll do everything that we ask, but uh, he he is all powerful, and he wants us to be persistent in prayer and to take comfort in the fact that while we may um, have tears in our eyes, we can know that. God's all-powerful, tender arms are around us, that he will preserve us, and that he will bring us safely home. If it wasn't for God's omnipotent power, I know that I would blaspheme the Spirit, but he won't let me. Um, and I take great comfort in the fact that it's God's power that will preserve me and bring me safely home. Fourthly, God's power is displayed in creation and in salvation. And then lastly, nothing, and I mean nothing, can thwart God's plans. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful truth of your omnipotence. You are all-powerful. You are holy. You are loving. You are merciful and you are gracious. All things are, are, these are all true of you at the same time. And that you're your graciousness is all-powerful. Your holiness is all-powerful. Your love is all-powerful. And you are worthy of all praise and honor. And I pray that any person who's listening to this who doesn't know you, that your Holy Spirit would come upon them um, and irresistibly draw them to you displaying the fact that you still are the Son of Man who came to both accomplish our redemption and the Holy Spirit who all-powerfully applies that redemption. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.